everything I will say will be pretty elementary, so, uh, if, so please stop me if you have any uh, issues with understanding or if I'm using unclear terminology, everything should be, should be easy. Um, and yes, I'm, I'm, I'm from Israel, so that means that you can stop me in the middle of the sentence and, and I wouldn't mind. So this is all joint work with some of my colleagues, Omer Angel, Martin Barlow from UBC, Ori Gorel-Buragic from the Hebrew University, Tom Hutchcroft from UBC, and Gura Gray, who is now in Cambridge. And I will tell you some things about random triangulations. Uh, but before I start, let me tell you some, some classical analysis that, uh, that everybody knows. So I'm interested in random triangulations and uh, diffusions and random walks on them. Um, <clears throat> so the first... Uh, consider Brownian motion on the hyperbolic disk. So this is a, is a classical fact. You have a, 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 a two dim a disk in two dimensions. You run hyper the Brownian motion inside. So it's a fact that you reach the boundary uh, and that you, you stick to it. And in fact, if you have any harmonic function, uh, if you have any harmonic function on the disk, it's actually an extension of a harmonic function or a, a harmonic function on the boundary. For any bounded harmonic function on the disk is essentially the can be represented as the uh, as you, you have there exists some uh, harmonic function some some functions not harmonic on the on the boundary such that the the value of the function inside the disk is the is the expected uh, expected value of where your bounded motion exits uh, this is this is it. And we're interested in, in bounded harmonic functions because they somehow encode the long-term behavior of the random walk or of your diffusion. Um, so in, in a sense, the long-term uh, behavior and invariant event of, is, is, for instance, of a Brownian motion is where do you stick? Uh, where do you hit the boundary? And it turns out that these are all the invariant events. So all other invariant events are generated uh, by, this, by these form of events. Um, and in fact, something much more stronger is, uh, is known. And there's a, in the world of surfaces, there's a, there's a complete dichotomy. And the behavior of the Brownian motion on the surface determines what type uh, the surface is. So you have two types of surfaces, uh, I guess three types, but I'm only going to be interested in the non-compact ones. Uh, and they could either be parabolic, in which Brownian motion is recurrent, it returns to every region infinitely often. In this case, the, the manifold of the surface will be conformal, conformally equivalent to the complex plane. And, all bound, and there are no bounded harmonic constants, uh, sorry, bounded harmonic functions that are non-constant. Uh, so this is, this is one side of the dichotomy, and the other one is uh, just the hyperbolic one. Surface in which the Brownian motion is transient, the surface will be conformally equivalent <coughs> to the open unit disk, uh, and any harmonic bounded harmonic function is an extension of a of a bounded function on the disk. These are these are pretty classical things, and uh, we want to find the discrete version of them. Uh, so, as in Stefan's talk, I will first talk about some deterministic uh, ideas and results uh, before. I talk about the random, random case, which is what we're really interested in. So in order to make sense of some discrete surface, and, uh, I need more than just a metric space, more than the combinatorial object. I need a way to draw the object in the plane. In general, in the last three years, this is, this is what I'm interested in, and what I'm, uh, not just me, of course, a lot of people are trying to do. And uh, you know, it's, you know, we understand now that uh, when you are given a plane of graph, if you know how to draw it in a particular way, you can learn many valuable, much valuable information about the behavior of random walks on it and you know, uh, other stochastic processes on it. Uh, and one nice way to draw a graph that I like very much, some people don't, uh, is, uh, is the circle packing theorem due to uh, Kebe. And this states that uh, when you start with a, a planar graph, you do one here, and uh, I just drew it do it by hand, uh, you can always uh, represent it as a tangency graph of a circle packing drawn here on the right. So a circle packing is a set of circles in the plane with disjoint interiors. Uh, some of them may be tangent, some of them may not. Um, and we form a tangency graph simply by taking the vertex set to be the set of circles, and two such circles form an edge if and only if they are tangent. 
Uh, so of course, if you have a drawing like this and you put uh, vertices at the center of circles and draw the straight lines between two tangent circles, then what you get is a planar graph. So if you have a so then the power of this theorem, of course, is the congress is true. If you have any planar combinatorial structure, you can actually find uh, a cube representation like that. And when your graph is a is a triangulation, nice to use this stick. In a while. When your graph is a triangulation, then your packing is unique up to Mebius transformations or, or reflections. Uh, so this is, uh, let's just go over the basic, the basic words that I'll be using in this talk. So the circle <coughs> packing is just what I said, it's kind of circles in the plane. The tangency graph is what I just defined. Uh, the carrier is another, so in, in, at least in the case of the triangulation, the carrier is the union of all the circles Plus, when you go, uh, if you look at every face that is a triangle, three circles, they have the space between them that people call the interstice, uh, which is a word I just heard of it about it three years ago. Uh, you take the union of that as well, and that is the carrier of your circle packet. Uh, we'll see examples in a minute. Uh, <clears throat> and we just, we just use the words if we have an infinite circle packing of a triangulation, if we can circle pack it in the disk, uh, we just say it's it, such that the carrier is the disk, we say we pack it in the disk, or we pack it in the plane. Here, uh, here are the, well, let's, let's, let's look at the example, and then uh, go back to the theorem. So here is one circle packing, uh, which is, as you can already guess, <coughs> hyperbolic nature. This is the semi-regular hyperbolic distillation, and you see that the circle is not a very good picture. Uh, and you see that there are infinitely many circles that converge to the boundary of the disk. Well, here I've drawn to you a part of the triangular lattice, and of course, the full one, the carrier. Right? So the carrier, we take the union of all the circles and this space here between them. So the carrier here will be the entire plane. The carrier here, the union of all the circles and this space will be the, um, will be the, unit, the open unit disk. And uh, these are the main theorems. Right? The first one I... That's in the classical, the first one I already told you, you start with a, with a you receive a finite planar graph. So the finite here is actually very important. Then there exists a circle packing that is unique. Uh, the, the reason this thing became popular is, is um, due to Thurston. Thurston's conjecture that I, I won't talk much about is circle packings in some way approximate uh, informal maps. Uh, the theorem that I will be talking about that will be important here is uh, a theorem of Herr Schramm that relates to the dichotomy that we saw uh, just earlier. If you have a circle packing, uh, then you can either draw it, you can either circle, if you have a, tri a, a triangulation, this sounds like an obvious thing, but it is highly non-trivial, then you, if you have any planar triangulation, uh, then you can, uh, that is one ended, this is what the word plane triangulation means, then you can either circle pack it in the disk or the or the plane, but not both of them. Yes, here. Yes. Uh, yes, here I meant infinite. Yes, thank you. That's the word plane. I'm getting every mistake. It's good thing that is not all the time. Yes, so the, when you think about it, it seems obvious, but it's it's highly non-trivial to prove that this is the case. Uh, and so we invented the words, we call a graph or a triangulation CP parabolic if it could be circle packed in the plane, and CP hyperbolic if it could be circle packed inside the unit disk. Uh, another very important theorem that we will see its use is that uh, I, I told you that there is uniqueness up to Mebius transformation of the, of the circle pattern that you get in the case of a finite triangulation. For some bizarre reason, the argument, there's a very easy argument that shows you this uniqueness, but it does not work when the circle packing is infinite, when it's a, a, it's a plane triangulation. In fact, it's a very difficult theorem of Schramm that I've been trying to find easy proofs for it for the last year unsuccessfully, in that when you have, you know, that these circle packings here, uh, the, either the parabolic or the hyperbolic one, they are unique also up to mid use transformation. And this will be very important for the results that I will show, I will show later. Um, here are the pictures, and here are the nicer pictures. 
uh, something that we will see soon. That uh, so so in addition to, to give, giving us the uh, giving us the circles, we put a, a we put a point at the center of the circle, and then we either draw uh, straight lines or hyperbolic geodesics. And because of the uniqueness, because of Schramm's rigidity, you know, uh, the fact that this circle pattern is unique up to conformal automorphisms of the of the uh, uh, of the of the disk. This means that quantities, hyperbolic quantities that you see in this picture, for instance, the angles between the angles in this in this hyperbolic triangle, they are determined by the combinatorics of the graph and not by the choice of circle pattern. So they are actually, even though it's a geometric uh, number, this is encoded inside the combinatorics of the graph. And this is something we will we will use very importantly. So when you have uh, a bounded degree triangulation. Geometry is bounded, uh, and um, the, the 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 way that you pack uh, the graph tells you a lot of information <coughs> about about probabilistic stochastic processes on this graph. For instance, the recurrence transients that we just uh, that we just saw, but also the existence <coughs> of non-trivial harmonic functions. So here's uh, here's the theorem that we saw, right? If you are CP parabolic. Uh, and you're in a bounded degree situation case, then you are recurrent for the simple random walk on the graph. And I want to stress that this theorem really does use the fact that the degree is bounded, that the geometry is bounded, and this will be, because you could create easily, if, you're, if you allow unbounded degree, you could create pathology. So here I started with the, uh, with the usual triangular lattice, and now I'm going to add uh, little circles here. So here I added, uh, in, the, in the interstices, I added one circle here and one circle here. Here I put two circles here and two circles here. This is already too small, but here I put four circles here and four circles here. And the random walker, when it walks on the graph, of course it doesn't see the circles, it just looks at the number of circles. So when you start from here, you'll have a slight <coughs> drift to the right. And when, you, when you're here, you'll have a slight drift to the right. So in fact, this graph that I've drawn to you is a transient graph. You, you manage, because of the unbounded degree, you manage to add a drift to this graph that will take you, um, you know, will take you to the right. So the random walker will walk around. Eventually, it will stick into this, uh, into this, into this, into this drift, and will be sucked into infinity. Here's another um, um, known theorem of Benjamin Chum. If you're in the CP hyperbolic case, uh, then in fact your random walker. Uh, your random walker will converge to the boundary. Uh, just like when you have Brownian motion on the disk, it, it converges to the boundary. When you're in a, in, in a discrete case, you have a, you have a random walker in a, in a graph like this, it will walk around and eventually converge to the boundary. And you could easily imagine to yourself that this result also requires bounded degree, because if you can, if you can add uh, if you can add drift just in the same way by adding a lot of circles in between, you can make it so that the random walker goes in a spiral and actually does not converge to the does not converge to the boundary. So here we also use the fact that the geometry is bounded. Uh, in, in this case, you need to converge to the boundary, and in fact, you get the same dichotomy. Uh, you're either if you're in the CP parabolic case, you're circle back in the in the uh, in the plane. You are either, then you are recurrent, and in this case you easily do not have any bounded harmonic functions, or you are transient, and then um, <clears throat> any harmon any bounded function on the on the sphere uh, extends to a uh, harmonic function on the on, on the graph simply by taking the expectation of where you of where you exit. This will be the value of the harmonic function at each point in the in the middle. You can ask yourself. Are these all the harmonic functions? Just like, is this a representation of the what mathematicians call the, the Poisson boundary? Perhaps this is called that as well. I don't know. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, or if you ask it differently, are there any other harmonic functions? And then the answer would be no. Um, indeed, any harmonic function, this is something we proved. Uh, Last year or two years ago, with the Omer Angel, Martin Barber, and Ori Gurevich, if we have any harmonic function on the on the graph, it is actually can be obtained. There, that means that there exists some function on the boundary such that this is the harmonic extension of it. So somehow it, it's, it's some, it says something probabilistic. It's 
once you know where the where the random walker converges to, if you know the point that it converges to, this contains all the invariant information. You cannot have a random walker converge to a point with probability half converging to it from this angle, or with probability half converges from that angle. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, there's uh, some information. Uh, once you know where it's, once you know where it's uh, uh, converges to, you have exposed all the invariant information. Uh, <coughs> well, let's skip that point. Uh, all of this theory is, is nice and, and really reflects on the continuous theory, but it really only works when you have a bounded a bounded degree. You can imagine that when you're allowed to add drifts to it whenever you want, you can actually create that situation exactly. I can add drift so I can con so I will converge to this one particular point, either from this direction or from this direction. And I can create all sorts of pathologies uh, uh, if I'm allowed to add bounded degree as, as much as we want to. But of course, we want to deal with uh, random triangulations in which we believe of which, in which the degree is not bounded as we, as we all know. There's no reason for it to be bounded by it. Any, any number, but somehow it's random. So, of course, a random triangulation will not choose a particular way, uh, a particular direction to have a drift, and somehow all the drifts or all the defects and curvature that you, that you incur should somehow cancel out. And uh, the point here is, you know, how do we, how do we formalize and prove <coughs> such a thing? Uh, so this is what we want to do. We, have a, we want to find an analog to the Hedstrom theorem that characterizes, as the Hedgehog theorem told you, a graph of bounded degree triangulation is, par is CP parabolic if and only if it's recurrent. Uh, do we have, can we say something about a random triangulation uh, by, uh, can we determine uh, its circle packing type just by you know, some very basic properties? Uh, these are the first two questions. And when we're in the hyperbolic case, can we recover this boundary theory? Can we show that a random walker converges to the boundary? Does it? Uh, does the limit have full support? That I actually actually didn't tell you that. Uh, well, perhaps it was written on the slide that the limit has the limit the exit measure has full support uh, and no atoms. Uh, can we can we prove something like this? Uh, is the unit circle a realization of the Poisson boundary? Is this still the case that all harmonic functions uh, are represented um, uh, this, this way? So, because in, in the random case we don't have the geometry is not bounded, we cannot use classical tools from complex analysis, such as extremal length and quasi conformal maps, because, well, nothing is bounded. You know, they, they, it, is, it is possible that the extremal length between two sides of the rectangle and this kind of thing will be not, uh, not bounded away from zero uh, or infinity. So all of, the, all of these tools are unavailable to us uh, in this situation. And what we really have to learn how to use is the inherent randomness of the, uh, of the triangulation. Uh, here's an example of, like, just in case you're worried that I'm about to show you theorems with no concrete example. So the, the simplest example of a hyperbolic, random hyperbolic triangulation is the just the Poisson Voronoi triangulation on hyperbolic space? We put a Poisson process of points. Uh, here is one point, second, and so far on the hyperbolic plane. You take the Voronoi distillation and then take the, the dual graph to it, and you've got. Um, and what you obtain is a is a is a is a triangulation of the hyperbolic uh, plane, the hyperbolic disk. Of course, this has not convinced you yet that this is the, that the circle I, I've drawn to you. Uh, you know, when you draw something like this, you know, it's, it looks very reasonable that it's hyperbolic. But I didn't convince you quite that the uh, that the circle packing type of it is hyperbolic. And the circle packing is actually a good thing because you know, it, you know, I may draw it like this, but this this picture could be so badly distorted that this is actually could be that this is a parabolic <coughs> drawing uh, without without knowing anything. Of course, this will be a uh, hyperbolic join. Uh, another uh, example that is actually uh, more important was uh, constructed by uh, Nicolas Courier and also uh, Omar Angel and Gura Bray is, is, uh, is an example of um, random hyperbolic or hyperbolic uh, triangulations that, serve, that satisfy a certain uh, Markov property. Uh, so for that, I need just to tell you what is, uh, uh, 
Did you mean Schramm convergence or local convergence of graphs? Uh, and this is a question that uh, Benjamini and Schramm raised to study how does a typical finite uh, triangulation of the graph <coughs> looks like from a, from a randomly chosen, chosen point. Uh, so here is the, the definition. You have a, a finite sequence of graphs, Gn. You choose a root vertex, rho n, uniformly at random. Uh, <coughs> and you say that the sequ finite sequence of graphs converge to a random rooted graph, G rho. So here, G is an infinite graph, and rho is a, is a vertex of this graph. If for any radius, the balls of radius r in graph distance around the randomly chosen uh, vertex uh, in G in the finite graph, converges to the ball of radius r uh, in the in distribution in the, in the infinite graph. So notice that because we're choosing a vertex at random, the, uh, right, we want to say how the graph looks from a typical point, then even if we start with deterministic graphs, Gn, the limit may still have randomness, and it may not be a, a deterministic graph. Let's look at some examples, because this is sometimes a, a confusing, uh, it could be a slightly confusing um, um, form of uh, convergence. Uh, so when you start with a, with a large tori, uh, then you, it's not surprising that you indeed converge to the infinite lattice. And the reason for that is, you know, when you draw a point in the, it, randomly, it's going to be somewhere in the middle, far away from the boundary, and when you look at the neighborhood around you of distance 10, for instance, then what you see is exactly the infinite lattice. And uh, uh, this is what happened. Let's skip this example. Uh, and here's a, a better, more illustrative example. You start with a binary tree on n vertices, and this uh, on binary tree, say, at height n, and it's tempting to say that uh, it will converge to the infinite binary tree, but this is not true because, you know, the binary tree only looks binary from the point of view of the roots, where the mass of the vertices is actually on the leaves, and on the leaves, when you're at a leaf and you look at your local neighborhoods, you don't look at all like a binary tree. In fact, you look like this uh, tree that is called the canopy tree. So this will be the, 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 the limit right? this graph, and the, the, choice of, of, uh, the choice of root will be, your, your, your root will be this one with probability 1 half, this one with probability 1 quarter, and so on. So notice that this is, this is not the binary tree in particular. This graph is a recurrent graph, right? It has just like one infinite line and, and finite branches hanging on it. Um, <clears throat> so there are two interesting theorems in this, uh, several of course, but here are two interesting theorems I'm going to tell you about. So firstly, let's, let's talk, let's look about the second one. So uh, uh, a really pioneering work of Omer and Audit Chang stated that if you draw a uniform random triangulation on n vertices, plane triangulation and you take the local limit of it, then the local limit exists. It's not, not something degenerate, it's a, it's, a, it's a triangulation of the plane. Uh, and they named it the uniform infinite uh, planar or plane triangulation. Um, before that, the Yemeni and Shom in the same paper where they define this limiting procedure, they proved that uh, Every Benjamini Schramm limit of finite simple triangulation is CP parabolic. So this is this is already a, a a pretty interesting statement. You start with what any finite sequence of finite triangulations that you have, you cannot get anything hyperbolic that way. Uh, I'll actually show you a proof of this theorem uh, in, a, in a different in a different way. Uh, this graph is recurrent. Um, the nice thing about the, the UITT is uh, so it, it doesn't follow from the Hedgehog theorem because this graph has unbounded degree. Uh, you need to say something to prove that it's, uh, it's a recurrent graph. Uh, the UITT has this nice Markov property that I won't define it uh, very very precisely, but it's a, it's a it's a random triangulation, right? It's a measure on triangulation. It's not any specific triangulation, but if you condition on, the, on the, the beginning of on some, some circle in the triangulation, some finite bit you know, with, the, with the root. So you say the root is here, and I see some finite bit on the triangulation. Uh, then the outside of the triangulation that you have not exposed 
the, the distribution of it now only depends on the length of this, uh, on the length of the perimeter of what you've seen and not on what you have inside. So if you fix the, the length of the perimeter to be 10, any triangulation that you put inside uh, and you condition that this is what you see you know, at, the, at the vicinity of the root does not affect the distribution of what you see outside. And this is a very useful property that uh, we expect to see in all sorts of uh, quantum gravity models. And so Angel uh, Omer Angel and Gore Greif has asked, you know, is, is this the only distribution on triangulations that have this kind of, uh, that have this kind of, uh, uh, have this property? And they discovered either, or again, they asked that the answer was uh, no. Uh, indeed, there is a whole spectrum of uh, such triangulations. Uh, and in fact, the UAP parabolic <coughs> one that we've just seen is in fact just one of them, and the rest of them are, are triangulations with hyperbolic flavor. So the, the theorem here, I, 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 I attributed it to Omer Andel and Guru Bray, but uh, they constructed it on the half plane, and uh, Nicola Kurian has a construction that works in the, in the full plane. Uh, <clears throat> and these are all, so what you get from these constructions, from Nicola Kurian's construction, is a, is a, is a spectrum of hyperbolic triangulation. These are measures that for each, if you choose a different kappa, you get singular measures. You get a measure on discrete uh, triangulations of you know, some hyperbolic flavor that I haven't told you, but of course they will be, they will be their circle packing, for instance, will be, will be hyperbolic. Uh, so there's a construction, but of course the more interesting thing is how do you get them in, in real life? In, the, in real life, this is this is an open problem. Uh, it is you you will get them as as local limits of uniform triangulations on a surface that has genus that is linear. You don't believe me? Right. Finish your statement first. So if it is believed, I can say what I believe. Uh, I live in a country with difficulties in that respect. Uh, it is believed that these hyperbolic triangulations are obtained as local limits, as Benjamini Schramm limits, of uniform triangulations on a, on a surface that is linear, that the genus of it is linear in the number of vertices. Right. Now, do you believe? No. No? <laughs> Excellent. Or, if you want, to you can receive another model of uh, another model of hyperbolic triangulations. Take local limits of these things. These things are a little bit harder <coughs> to handle because, as, as uh, Ramon Rod say, said earlier today, we do not know how to count uh, triangulations of, of surfaces of, of general genus. We know genus zero excellent, but genus that is linear, it's, we, it's, uh, it seems it seems difficult. And by we, I mean they. Here's a, you know, this whole talk is to show you this nice picture in which we generated the circle packing of, uh, of uh, Nicolas uh, uh, random hyperbolic triangulation, and this is how it looks like. As you see, it's very rough. It has no has areas of, of very very teeny weeny circles, and then some giant circles, and there doesn't seem to be any any. And the degree is unbounded, which is probably hard to see from from this picture. Uh, so here's, here's, yes? What's kappa for that? What is kappa for? What is in that picture? Which, what, what's the value of kappa? I mean, oh. Take kappa very small, yes. how does the picture change? Um, well, it becomes, it becomes more hyperbolic. The degree, the degree grows. Okay. Yes. Uh, in fact, there's a, there, if you look at the expected degree, there's a formula for it in terms of kappa. Uh, so what is you know so what is the property of a random triangulation that we want to use? Uh, typically, when you study these kind of combinatorial objects, you know, is, uh, you want to argue in the form, okay, let's draw one of them, let's draw one of these things. Almost surely, it will have this and this and this and that property. And now, any deterministic graph that has this and this and that property, we can prove something about it. So this 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 does not work in the whole business of random triangulation. Method of work, method of proof is, uh, is, uh, does not uh, yield a lot of things. What does yield, uh, or at least help us in this case, is uh, the notion of unimodularity. And perhaps it's a badly chosen name, again, not by me, and I would say I would call it just random or something like that. But 
that's more of a, a PR, PR thing. So let me try to explain to you what is the basic property of these random triangulations that you would that you would get from uh, from Benjamini Schramm limits. And in fact, this is, this may seem like a bit of a scary definition, but almost all of the examples that we have of, of random structures, uh, uh, percolation cluster, easy cluster, they are all they all satisfy this. So this is not some <coughs> weird thing that only random triangulates. This is a very natural thing. Uh, and the fact that it holds for you know for a for a local limit for a Benjamini Schramm limit is, is almost a triviality. So it's very hard to very sorry very easy to prove that this kind of thing holds. How to use it is a bit more mysterious. So what it says it's a very uh, it's an interesting concept. So you have uh, what it means is that um, you have a transport. A transport is a function f. Uh, that receives the graph and receives two vertices and decides how much mass to transport from one vertex to another. So for any vertex, for any pairs of vertices on the graph, the transport moves mass from, from any two vertices, u and v, transport mass from u to v. And the, it has to be automorphism invariant, which is the mathematical way of saying you're not allowed to do things like, oh, what's the name of this vertex? We called it vertex number one. In that case, let's, let's do something. You're only allowed to look at your combinatorial neighborhood to look at like how many vertices do you have and what you know all sorts of combinatorial information around you and according to that make your decision. So you can think about it as an algorithm and that is the input that it is allowed to know. Another thing you're allowed to know uh, to do is to flip some independent coins as well, which is um, which you could do. So <coughs> you want to write, this is a, a random graph. Uh, if for any such transport f G star star is the space of graphs with two two groups on them. Uh, is means if you, it's called unimodular. If for any such transport, the the expected mass out, which is this, you sum over all the vertices. Rho is the root, and this is the mass coming out of the root to all of the vertices. Is the expected mass going into the root? For instance, a transport would say just. Uh, give all your neighbors your degree and uh, normalize it. You know, give all your neighbors, sorry, your degree divided by, uh, no, or just your degree. Right? And then uh, what will you get? You will get that the mass going out, uh, the expected mass going out is your degree square. Right? And uh, your mass going in will be the average of the degree square from your, right? Every vertex that is your neighbor sends you its degree. So what you will get is, uh, I may got a little confused uh, with this. I'll show you in a minute a neat way. So I'll, a lot of the proofs that go in, in this world is actually go by find the right transport to give you something. So let me show you the first something uh, that is not trivial like sending your degree. Uh, and I, again, I want you to notice that this is a, a property of the law of a uh, the, the distribution of the graph, and not of any particular any particular graph. Well, for one particular graph, this holds for, for Cayley graphs, and even even this is not a trivial. This is easy to prove, but it's not a trivial statement for for Cayley graphs. It holds for Cayley graphs, and it, in fact, it holds for any distributional for any distributional limit. In fact, there's a big open question in group theory whether this property can only be obtained by graphs that are distributional limits. They're all are all the modular graphs software? So, um, question? So here's a, here's a, our first theorem that I that I will uh, that I will show you the proof of it uh, now. If you have a unimodular plane triangulation, then it is CP parabolic if and only if the expected degree is six, and it is hyperbolic if the expected degree is bigger than six. So of course, in this crowd, no one is surprised by the appearance of the number six. Uh, in this in this context, uh, but I, but let me convince you that it actually this, this theorem, which I will prove to you in, in five minutes, uh, with this with this mass transport, actually implies and gives you a, a pretty simple proof of this Benjamini Schramm uh, theorem that I that I stated to you because it shows but it shows in fact that if you and it's it's simple to see because if you have a distribution of limit of finite planar triangulation, the or finite planar triangulation, the expected degree is six. And this is maintained in the limit. Right? So for, for distribution of limits, the expected degree is always is always six. The distribution of limits of triangulations, and hence they are CP parabolic. And this is this was the Benjamini-Schramm 
uh, theorem without this difficult dilemma that appears there. Um, let me show you the proof. So again, I'm going back. The proof relies on the fact that if you have a circle packing, uh, then it is, if you have a circle packing and a triangulation either in the disk or in the plane, then it is rigid by the theorem of uh, Schramm from his PhD. That means that the angles that you, if you have three vertices, then the angle that, that, that creates a corner, three vertices in a space, this is something that is determined combinatorially. And by that, that means that uh, a transport that I've defined to you before can use that number. You can calculate it just by looking at the neighborhoods of the graph and you get, uh, and you get this number. So here's a mass transport, a vertex x. Think about it as the root. Uh, you go over each of your corners right, and you calculate this, uh, this angle alpha. Uh, so in this case, right, I started with, uh, as you see, the lines are straight. So I started with a CP parabolic drawing. Right? I'm starting with a CP parabolic. My goal is to prove this theorem. If you're CP parabolic, then your expected degree is 6 or something of this sort. So I have a packing of this. Uh, I look at the I look at the angle and then I send it to the neighbors uh, of my corner, right? To y and z and also to x yourself, right? So the mass and I do it for all the rest of the corners. Right? So eventually I sent this uh, alpha. I sent it three times and I did it for all of the angles here. So the mass, the total mass that I sent out was two pi times three, at six pi. What is the mass going in? So I look at each of these corners, each of these triangles, and now this vertex y has sent me this angle. Here's this. I received this angle, x received this angle uh, from y, this angle from z, and also from itself. So each of these corners gave you mass of exactly pi. Right? And the number of corners is exactly the degree of your vertex x. So what you've got is 6 pi equals uh, the expect pi times the expected degree. Hence, the expected degree has to be 6 if you're in a CP parabolic graph. Same argument exactly works uh, for the uh, hyperbolic case. If your graph is CP hyperbolic, you do the same thing. Right? But this time, you cannot draw straight lines because, uh, because right, the, the rigidity tells you that because uh, the angle, if I drew here straight lines, then the angle would depend on my choice of passing. Only when, I, only when I draw hyperbolic lines, the angle does not change after a conformal automorphism, and that's why this alpha here is, like, is, a, is a number that my mass transport can calculate. And so because, uh, and I do the same argument, but this time because the sum of angles in a hyperbolic triangle is always smaller than pi, what I get is that the expected degree has to be bigger than 6. And that's it. That's, that's the proof. So this was this was uh, this was a mass transport, and uh, I'll try to show you uh, one more. I will skip all of these things, but I want to state a theorem. Uh, I didn't really plan to talk about all these, all these things. Uh, there's this notion of invariant amenability and not invariant non-amenability of a hyperbolic uh, triangulation that I, I won't get into. You can't really expect a hyperbolic, a random triangulation to be non-amenable in the classical sense, so that every finite set expands itself. Because you, you will have you know, local distortions. You can have places in which you know, the, the map looks parabolic. But somehow, these places occur far away from the root, uh, and they will have you know, the, the probability that it, they occur close somehow decays, and, and th there's a way to, dis to, to, to find a, a better notion of amenability, and this, is, in fact, also is a part of the dichotomy. Uh, 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 a random triangulation is CP hyperbolic, if and only if it is non-amenable in, uh, in this sense. Uh, and, but I, want, I do want to recover for you, to, to state to you the theorem that we are, are able to re recover the boundary theory. And this is joint work with, uh, again, Omar Anjo, uh, my student Tom Hotchcroft, and uh, Gura Gray. <coughs> if you're in a hyperbolic unimodular random planar triangulation, this is a technical degree that uh, we need uh, the, the square of the, of the degree to have finite expectation. You circle back within the plane, then you have several things that occur. Uh, a random walker will converge to the boundary. 
So even though the degree is unbounded, you know, the, the, the defects cancel each other, and you cannot create a drift that prevents you from convergence, <coughs> the law of the exit measure has full support in no atoms. Uh, and all, uh, all bounded harmonic functions are extensions of, of functions on the, on the sphere, on the circle. Uh, let me just show to you, and just because I want to show you mass transport, I'll skip the proof. I'll just so assume, assume that everything in this theorem is true, except for the fact that, and, and let me prove to you that the measure has full support. I'm just showing this part to you because it has a nice mass transport into it. And again, the mass transport will use the hyperbolic geometry, and, and here it is. I'll skip to it. Ooh, very nice things. Uh, okay. Five more minutes. All right. That was a joke. No. <laughs> uh, five minutes. Uh, suppose that the exit measure does not have full support, and I will try to to to, to reach a contradiction by constructing a, a weird mass transport, and it will have the property that each vertex will send mass, which is at most one out but some vertices will receive infinite mass. You can convince yourself this is not very hard, that if some vertices receive infinite mass, then there's positive probability that the root will receive infinite mass, and in that case, the expected mass going in has to be infinite. So this is already a contradiction to the mass transport principle. And again, <coughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to you know, start with a, with, a, with a hyperbolic random triangulation, assume it doesn't have full support, draw it with a circle packing in the plane, and then now I want to reach a contradiction, and I want to uh, create a mass transport that only looks at the hyperbolic geometry. So I look at the complement of the support. So this is not everything. So I can write that the support is always closed. So I can write it as a disjoint uh, set of intervals. Here, here they are. Um, the complement of the support. Uh, so here, this, I, I looked at this particular. So this interval, for instance, is not in the support. And now I draw this hyperbolic geodesic between the two ends of the, of the point of such an interval. Uh, I don't remember my Greek very well. This is phi i and this is theta i. Okay, great. And a i will be all the circles that are packed here. So I'm not drawing the circles because this will make the picture a little bit involved. Uh, so a i is all the circles that are drawn here, right? This is just the unit disk and all the circles are, are drawn in here. And now this, these are the circles that intersect uh, the geodesic. And now my transport is going to be, I look at a vertex u that, inside, that is inside one of these. If it's not inside, then I send no mass. And then I draw the geodesic from its hyperbolic center to uh, the, the, uh, the edge of the interval on, on its left. And I will uh, give mass 1 to the first circle that it hits that also intersects the, this geodesic. <coughs> in this picture, I just go on this line until I hit one of these circles. So in this picture, u will transport mass 1 to v. And, that's, and uh, I hereby define to you uh, a legitimate transport. And now let's see that it uh, uh, gives you a contradiction. Uh, and again, if, if, if this doesn't, doesn't hit anything or it doesn't hit anything, you send no mass. And it gets you a contradiction because uh, you look at this vertex, and you look at all, uh, uh, and you look at, and you look at this this BV. So this is a, a subinterval uh, such that if you had a circle here, it would hit it would hit uh, this this vertex here um, for the first time. Uh, now, when you go over all of these circles from here up to here, and you draw this BFV. What you get is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a union, a countable union of intervals that gives you this entire interval. Uh, so one of these intervals has to be, because it's a finite, sorry, it's a countable union, so one of these intervals, I've drawn it here like that, this, it, there, some intervals could be empty, could be you know, trivial intervals uh, uh, with nothing in them except for a point, but because it's a countable union, one of them has to have uh, you know, one of them has to have positive length. And now I claim that because of this, then, then of course this vertex has to receive infinite mass because there are infinitely many teeny weeny circles here that will send mass 1 to it. And that's it. So we've reached a contradiction, hence the, 
the support has to be in full. What, what do you use the uh, hypothesis of the exit measure of the uh, 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 the, the hypothesis, hypo, hypothesis that the exit measure. But you, you suppose that in the interval that I five I, the exit measure has a zero mass. Yes. And yeah. you, what do you use this? Uh, you, you are right. You know, what, it, what it states, it states in fact that uh, I didn't use here anything, anything uh, very. Uh, this, uh, you are right. That, that in fact, there is a more general statement. In these kind of, in these kind of things, you cannot. Define a measure on the boundary which will be, you know, equivariant with respect to, to, to the to the moves of the walk and the conformal automorphisms that will satisfy this. You're right. I haven't used anything here. I just used the. Use the fact that the are intrinsic. Are what? Intrinsic to both. Yes. Yes. I use that. That I can just calculate it. Calculate this measure combinatorially from the from the graph. There's. there's <coughs> I don't know of any other measure on the boundary that satisfies this, uh, but this is uh, you know, a measure that just like picks some uniform points does not does not work. You have to, it has to be invariant to the to the to conformal automorphisms. Uh, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Is it possible to extend the kind of argument you just gave to show that the exit measure is in fact uniform? It is not uniform. It is not uniform. It is not uniform. In fact, in all of these, in all of these cases, uh, even in a, in a fixed deterministic graph, the exit measure is very, very fractal and weird. And uh, the the seven the, the seven regular hyperbolic tessellation and circle packing the exit measure here is very is very uh, is very fractal. In fact, it is very difficult to give an example. There's just one example of a uh, Bourguin in which the exit measure, it's not even Lebesgue, it's just absolutely continuous to Lebesgue. Yes, unfortunately, this is not the case with this, with Yes, sir. When you have this dichotomy with uh, this dichotomy with uh, the average degree, mm -hmm. you said that the average degree is preserved in the local limits. Is it completely obvious? Uh, yes, I like. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it doesn't. You can't just uh, 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 apply it to that way. In fact, the, the inverse of the average degree, the one sixth, is the thing that uh, that is uh, that is maintained. But it all, if you also have an exponential tail or <coughs> even some some reasonable tail on the degree, then you get that average degree is, is maintained. But you're right, and, and thank you for exposing my uh, lie to everyone here. <laughs> yeah. So question. So in a way, you can think of it as exploring why the circle packings spaces with diff different curvature. Uh, to be. Yes, absolutely. This is a way to uniformize the curvature, so so I feel it less because a uh, uh, high curvature will be will be represented as a as a, as a larger circle, you know, low curvature by a smaller circle. So somehow the circle packing theorem tries to you know, tries to smoothen it all out. If one was interested in encoding. Local curvature properties, you know, in these structures, and people on the graph have been trying to introduce notions of curvature which also involve mass transport. Yes, yes. Degree, and in fact, so it's, it's some of what you've talked about. Well, if you invite me again, then I will give you a talk that works for a general, and then where we define curvature in this in this setting and do mass transport to prove all those sorts of things, even beyond the case of translations <coughs> on any kind of mass in any genus and things like that, as long as it is random in the sense that it is unimodular. If there are no further questions, I suggest we have coffee and we convene at half past. <laughs>